It's just after dusk during the rainy season in East Africa. The darkness is filled by a thousand voices. It's the serenade of the frogs, a sort of male voice choir, each one advertising his presence to the silent females nearby. The rains will last only a few weeks. And each night during that period, the frogs will emerge to feed, call, mate, and leap in the dark. For 10 months of the year, this is the frog's habitat. The ponds are dry and the earth is hard and cracked. The frogs, so dependent on water, would last only a few minutes if exposed to these conditions. But they have learned to survive from one rainy season to the next. Where the frogs succeed, many other animals fail. The grey tree frog hides beneath the bark of a tree, while the tiny water lily frog sits glued to the shady underside of a leaf. Others, like this shovel-nosed frog, sit out the dry season underground. So too does the bullfrog, all one kilogram of it. It sealed itself inside a watertight film of dried mucus. The distant roll of thunder heralds the arrival of the rains. The frogs begin to emerge from their long, dry sleep. Their dehydrated bodies will almost double in weight over the next few hours as they soak up water. As the moisture seeps into the ground, the bullfrog breaks free from its protective covering. The dry skin is the first of the bullfrog's many meals during the wet season. At over 20 centimetres long and almost the same across, it's one of the largest frogs in the world and a voracious eater. It's not long before the pools are filled with water and the landscape is transformed. As night falls, the frog orchestra tunes up. Their instruments are these remarkable vocal sacs, which come in all shapes and sizes and produce all kinds of noises.
The purpose of the frog's call is to attract a mate, and then the spawning begins. The African bullfrog is an exception in the frog world, in that the male is over twice the size of the female. It's usually the other way round. During mating, she almost disappears under his enormous bulk. Thousands of pinhead-sized eggs are laid, scattered over the bottom of the pond. The tadpoles hatch very quickly. They have to. The water will disappear almost as soon as it arrives. As the pools shrink, the race to grow quickens, and the tadpoles become cannibalistic and turn on each other. Those that survive develop legs, back ones first and then the front ones. Finally, the tail shrinks and three weeks after spawning, the two centimetre long, fully formed young can leave the water. Their one aim in life is to eat as much as they can and as quickly as they can. They're attracted by movement and will eat anything up to their own size. Beetles, caterpillars and other small insects are all crammed into a mouth that seems to stretch halfway round the frog's body. Cannibalism is very common and the little bullfrogs are capable of swallowing siblings of almost the same size. There are some insects, though, that are just a little too big to eat, for the time being, anyway. Within three years, they reach maturity and can eat large prey like this freshwater crab. With luck, the frog will live to the ripe old age of 20. Some frogs are far more particular when it comes to their choice of diet. The narrow-mouthed toad feeds almost exclusively on ants and termites. Termites are also a favorite food of many other frogs, like this red-legged cassina. As the frog blinks, its large eyes bulge down into the mouth cavity and help to force the insect down its throat. But frogs too have many enemies. This green snake is searching the undergrowth around the water's edge for newly emerged froglets. The green snake isn't poisonous, nor does it kill its prey by constriction. It simply swallows small animals alive. The snake will eat over a dozen little frogs in a single meal. But while the reptile is busy feeding, it too is being eyed up as a potential meal. The bullfrog, attracted to the snake's movements, pounces. The frog doesn't have teeth as we know them. Instead, it has two large bony projections from the lower jaw that fit into sockets in the upper jaw. These, coupled with its mouth's vice-like grip, provide the bullfrog with a formidable bite. Once its prey has been seized, there's little chance that it will escape. 
It takes only a few minutes for the frog to devour the 40 centimeters long snake. It's just one of the many meals it will have to find in order to build up enough fat to see it through the long dry season. Not all the frogs of East Africa lay their eggs directly into water. The shovel-nosed frog spends most of its life underground. It doesn't even have to enter the ponds in order to breed. Everything is done in the privacy of its burrow. These four centimeter long frogs will live, mate and breed beneath a half a meter or so of earth. The male remains tightly clasped around his mate's waist as she drags him through the burrow. Their scientific name of hemisus literally means half pig and refers to their conical pig-like faces. The eggs, about 200 of them, are laid in a solid jelly-like cake about five centimeters across. They're quite large for amphibian eggs, over a third of a centimeter in diameter. The female sits on them until they hatch. There is some evidence that a secretion from her skin prevents the eggs from being destroyed by fungus. After 10 days, her vigil is almost at an end. The eggs have hatched. The centimeter long tadpoles wriggle over and around her moist body. The pale area on the underside of each tadpole is a supply of yolk. They have enough food in reserve to keep them going for several days. The adult frog has dug a burrow down from the nest chamber to the water's edge nearby. The tadpoles instinctively slither downwards. They usually emerge under the cover of darkness. The advantage of this method of breeding is that it cuts out the water-bound eggs and early tadpole stages, which are always the most vulnerable, making easy pickings for aquatic predators. By releasing a relatively small number of offspring into the water as well-developed tadpoles, the shovel-nosed frog ensures that they have a fighting chance of survival. The bullfrog, on the other hand, simply released thousands of eggs into the pond. And although many would have been eaten, certainly some must survive out of so many. The two frogs have simply adopted different strategies when it comes to the all-important process of reproduction. The hemisus tadpoles will spend the next three weeks in the pond. Once the legs have developed and the tail has been absorbed, the tiny froglets will leave the water, never having to return. The same principle of laying fewer but well-protected eggs is used by the grey tree frog. But instead of laying its eggs underground, this frog lays them in the trees. The grey tree frog waits until the cover of darkness to build its nest. It's a joint effort between the male and female. The female, underneath and much the larger of the two, is bloated with eggs. The male sits on her back, not only to help in the construction of the nest, but also to fertilise the eggs as they're laid.
It's also known as the foam nest tree frog because the eggs are protected in a frothy white mass. The foam is whipped up by the two frogs and seems to be a combination of mucus from the female's back and a secretion from her oviducts. The pair will spend most of the night nest building, pausing only occasionally for a rest. The small white eggs are laid scattered among the foamy mass, the outer surface of which will soon harden. Often several pairs of frogs join in to make one large communal nest. Even spare males will lend a hand, or more precisely, a foot. Each female has laid over a hundred small white eggs. The following morning, a lone tree frog, exhausted after her night's work, adds some finishing touches to her nest. Five days later, the eggs have hatched. The tadpoles, each one barely one centimetre long, wriggle around inside the nest and break down the foam into a liquid. As the nest dissolves, the tadpoles drop into the water below and swim away. They enter the pool as well-formed swimmers, able to escape from many of the predators within it. But this remarkable system isn't foolproof. If the tadpoles hatch on a particularly hot or windy day, the liquid that protects them dries and leaves them hanging down like stalactites to their fate in the sun. If there are no overhanging trees available, the frogs will sometimes spawn on a convenient rock. But during the heat of the day, the temperature of the rock can rise dramatically. The nest on the left has already dried out and only a few of the tadpoles from this one will make it to the water. The pair of tree frogs which built this nest left it too late in the season and where once there was water, now there is only dried and cracked earth. The rainy season is now at an end and the frogs two months of feeding, courting and breeding is over. Now all they have to do is ensure that they can survive for the next ten months until the next rains. The bullfrog shuffles backwards into the loose soil. Soon it will dry and bake hard in the sun. It's well stocked up with water and fat, built up from its impressive menu of scorpions, centipedes, crabs, snakes, small mammals, countless insects and, of course, other frogs. As it disappears, a butterfly sucks up its last drink from the moisture in the disturbed soil. The butterfly won't see the next rainy season. Thirty centimetres below the surface, it crouches, surrounded in its watertight skin, ready to sit it out. 
its heartbeat will slow down to a level which will just keep its body ticking over. All around, the rest of the frogs are following the bullfrog's example. The narrow-mouthed toad disappears rapidly into the ground with the aid of little horny pads on its hind feet. The shovel-nosed frog, aptly named, goes in head first, using its snout like a bulldozer and back legs to drive it forward. It's only rarely seen above the ground, even in the wet season. Beneath the surface lies a maze of tunnels and chambers. The little pixie is a close relative of the bullfrog. At five centimetres, it's only a fraction of the size. It takes its last look at the African countryside before disappearing for the next 10 months. The frogs that emerged at the onset of the rains to leap in the dark are now buried deep underground, asleep in the dark. You may remember Manfred Mann had a pretty flamingo, but tomorrow night five's got two million of them at the Nakura National Park. Wildlife at 7.30.